I'm good. I'm trying to suck down some breakfast before we get started. <laughs> it's not a good look. <laughs> All right. Let me... And we're trying to hold off on turning our heat on until Thanksgiving. David, you've got your scarf on too. Yeah. A blanket that you can't see. <laughs> You're sitting next to my window that is not insulated. <laughs> I'm pretty sure my front wall is not really insulated. But I didn't know that until I started working from home. And the light's really nice. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> watch everyone. Just need a blanket. So. <laughs> hey, David, there was one thing that I thought we could add to the agenda, you know, since, since we don't have enough on there already. Um, yeah, we're really light today <laughs> um i think we could direct people to stacy abrams organization just to follow up on um our voter involvement if anyone's interested in engaging with georgia uh i think many people across the entire nation yeah are interested in that i was gonna um text danielle and let her know because they can just throw it in the marketing updates all right. Oh, Danielle can't agenda. join today. That's right. She has an SD meeting. All right. I'm going to share my screen. Coat marketing. I'll just add it here right after the coat marketing. Follow up on election. Yeah, it's called fairfight.com. Yeah. And you can volunteer out of state. Or fairfight.com is the website. Fairfight. That woman is amazing. <laughs> it feels really good to be able to say good things about Georgia. Yeah, I wish I could say good things about my home state of North Carolina, but oh my God. <laughs> Pennsylvania just pulled it out, so I, I can stay here a little bit longer, I think. All right, there we go. Hey, hey. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? Hey, good. Yeah, my meeting got moved till 8.30, so I figured I'd try and catch the at least the first half. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Oh. How are you doing? Oh, good. Things are good. It's a little bit of a chaotic time, but better than the alternative, I guess. Yeah. How about you? Doing well. Um, I was actually in Georgia for like an early Thanksgiving um, oh, over nice. the last four days, visiting with my family um, and working from my grandmother's house, which was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm back in Philly. Nice. Well, welcome home. How's your grandmother? She's great. Um, she was painting while I was working and she would like stand behind my computer with her canvas and ask for feedback. <laughs> it, was, it was really funny. <laughs> and then she held up a piece of paper that said, do you ever get a lunch break? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there are days like that. I mean, what news. kind of painting? What kind of painting does she do, Bunny? So normally, she all of her life she's painted with oils, and she paints, you know, landscapes, still lifes, um, mm -hmm. and she'll like reproduce other paintings that she really likes or photographs. But my sister recently asked her to paint a large tiger head um, in purple acrylic. That's very specific. As one <laughs> does. A really different experiment um, but she's enjoying working on a big canvas with acrylic paint for the first time oh. and that's what i'd used before so we were having a fun dialogue about it how fast it dries comparatively but you can get like a textured layering yeah yeah Sherman, do you, how are you do a lot of painting i mean not since architecture <laughs> but i i did in high school and college <laughs> takes our time all out of the fun stuff yeah well and if i didn't spend so much time outside 
<laughs> oh, did I save? Good morning. Hello. Good morning, Steve. Good. Hey, Todd. Welcome. Good morning, Todd. had me dreaming of photovoltaic panels on my roof this morning while I was out walking the dog. <laughs> it's a vision of what's to come. And thinking about electric boilers. Oh. Well, we made a big investment in a, in a super high efficiency natural gas boiler about six years ago and I don't think I'm going to take it out anytime soon, but boy, it cut the cut the use of fuel by half, and we had oil before, so we cleaned up the our carbon footprint quite a bit, but not completely. Yeah, it was probably about ten or eleven years ago we we got a uh, modulating condensing Weil McLean boiler, mm. so it just emits a little little bit of. Um, <clears throat> moisture you know air out the sidewall but right doesn't even go up the chimney it just nope. goes out the wall i know it's good so here's a question i've been on uh, npr they've been promoting the energy co-op that has renewable natural gas yeah why is that it's made from methane from landfills and hmm. it's really odd to call it renewable I guess, except that it is reusing waste fossil fuel in landfills to generate new natural gas. It then gets pumped into the natural gas pipeline. It's like, there's no way you can get that gas in your house. It blends with the whole grid, but, um, and it still burns in the boiler, but the sourcing of it is much less impactful on the environment because they're taking it from the landfill. So uh, it's also from sewage treatment plants. Uh, they uh, do odor control and methane recovery at sewage treatment plants is also renewable. Uh, wow. They also do it at farms and agricultural facilities now. Um, they see that as a great source and it's renewable. That methane, if it were to escape into the environment, uh, which it does, if it's not um, uh, pumped out into the system is uh, 30 times worse than CO2. So it is a right. significant uh, change in the um, greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, Steve, down in Austin, Texas, uh, where I went to grad school, they have a place called Hornsby Bend mm -hmm. in East Austin that uh, is basically a, a sort of secondary sewage treatment plant that uh, takes, takes the sludge through all natural processes. And one of them is they, they get the methane out of their anaerobic chambers right. and use that to generate all the electricity that they need on, on site. It's, uh, uh, you'll see, uh, especially in New Jersey, uh, an awful lot of uh, water and wastewater treatment plants have gone to solar as well as uh, renewable natural gas uh, for powering their systems uh, because uh, both those places are energy hogs. They, they use energy uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, so. Right. Oh, good, good. I signed up a month or two ago. Um, I know there's a premium in cost, but I think it's a, it's a small, when you look at the whole bill, the actual gas usage is a small piece. It's the distribution you're paying a lot for, so. Yeah, and uh, the EU is, um, 110% in on this. They, they just, uh, they don't do anything without recovering the methane now. Excellent. Good. Good. All right. So how many folks do we have? Oh yeah, we we're definitely, we've got a good yeah, participation so far. Yeah. We got like 26 people so far. All right. Well, uh, we got a packed uh, agenda for today and we are really happy to have Todd uh, Belson with Solar States here this morning to speak about uh, their efforts on decarbonizing uh, Philadelphia, about their equitable practices for providing uh, clean energy jobs to Philadelphians. Uh, 
Bunny, you talked with with Todd. So, I, I, you know, are there other sort of high level uh, things to, to, you know, sort of highlight the folks? Yeah, Todd's going to uh, give us an introduction um, to their organization um, and the way they're organized, too, uh, and then also policy considerations. And I hope he's going to uh, relay some ways that we can get involved to support their incredible work, too. Um, he came uh, highly recommended by some folks in our group uh, that have done some work with their organization. And um, we had a great talk last week, and we're just really excited uh, to have him present a whole group. We'll Solar States is a B Corp for those who are aware of that whole process. So that's, I think, pretty significant. So thank you, Todd. Do you have anything you need to present, Todd? I can stop sharing and. Uh, I have a slide deck that okay. I can pop up if I can share my screen, if that's all right. Yep. Great. Uh, thanks again for having us and for Ed uh, Robinson, I think is one of the ways we met and also for Bunny for um, have, you know, for the invitation and all these kind words, um, I hope we live up to it. Um, so what I was hoping to do is if it's all right with you all is just, um, I have a kind of a short talk that isn't hopefully that's hopefully, I think it'll cover most of the things that you just mentioned and then leave a lot of time for discussion. Um, and it's very informal. So just, you know, pop in the chat or let me know at any point if you uh, want to discuss anything. Uh, does that sound okay? Sounds, Sounds great. great. Thanks. And again, we're really appreciative of the opportunity to speak to. I see some old friends too. So very nice. Um, again, my name is Todd Bailson, and uh, we appreciate the invite. I do business development for Solar States. Um, we're located at 1500 North American Street. Can you all see the screen okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Cool. All my time. Um, and, uh, you know, like you said, we're a B Corp. We're trying to be part of a values based economy, like many of you, um, doing solar and also workforce, local hire, policy work. And then we do a lot of educational programming. So, kind of trying to fully sort of wrap our goals of getting solar to be a more uh, prominent part of the energy industry, uh, creating local jobs, and also kind of improving the environment. And uh, in addition to being a B Corp, which it sounds like many of you know, you know, you have a, the three legs of the stool, people, planet, profit written into your corporate bylaws and sort of abide by certain policies and practices. Uh, we offer health care. Um, we do a lot of things that your conventional construction company doesn't do. Um, we're also an Amicus Solar member. So Amicus is a really neat uh, co-op that's national. We're a big part of our trade association nationally, but um, Amicus sort of is more of the flavor of the company we are. It's sort of like for skiers out there, it's like the Alta compared to the Snowbird or like the Mad River Glen. You know, we're sort of like trying to make a better future and working together to do it, even though we're in very different places. Um, and then, uh, you know, like Bunny uh, mentioned, we're um, really intentionally local and diverse. So we're 80% Philadelphia residents. We're about 40 now and growing through the coronavirus recession. It's unbelievable. And we're very thankful and appreciative. Um, and we're 80% Philadelphia residents, 40% not white and 15% um, female. Um, which is uh, pretty rare in the uh, industry. And David, I will just do that right now. Uh, solarstates.com. I just put my uh, contact info in the chat, which was requested. Smart. You guys are ahead of your times. So um, we're most recently most proud of this mega project that we did, uh, which is on the yards uh, brewery and um, sort of, you know, uh, uh, restaurant and bar at Fifth and Spring Garden. Um, it's a really critical project for us and for a lot of folks because um, it got a big state grant. Um, it's actually the first commercial multi-tenant solar array in Pennsylvania. And you can't do projects like this without a village. And uh, we were fortunate to kind of curate this group. Alliance HSP is the building owner. They really stuck with us. Um, we worked together to get the grant, which really made the project happen. And then um, the other tenants are Target and the city's um, uh, archives, which I'm sure is a really of interest to you and your colleagues. And so having the city as a tenant was a big part of the project's momentum because, you know, the city has goals that we're trying to help uh, meet um, in terms of energy efficiency or, or um, you know, more renewable energy. So, um, uh, so, 
So there's this link in the bottom left here, and I understand you all will get this slide deck if you want it. And the link goes to a virtual presser that the city and city council put together. It's a little long, but like the governor talks and the guy from Yards gives this like passionate speech from the jungle somewhere. And um, our parts at the end, it's pretty silly, but it sort of speaks to the type of partnership that we try to cultivate with big projects and which is required for something like this to happen. Um, we're also doing a ton of different interesting things. Um, I just wanted to throw up a couple examples. This is a carport with EV chargers in KOP. Um, this is uh, Ursula Hobson's framing store and residence at 16th and Locust, which is just kind of a cool picture. You find good solar roofs in all types of places. And then this is our bread and butter um, residential uh, flat roof in many cases, um, row home solar in and around Philadelphia. And a lot of people don't think that this is possible and it's actually a really excellent way to kind of further the energy efficiency and sustainability of our, you know, sort of wonderful and typical row home. Uh, this is another just sort of interesting photo of a larger um, dwelling in South Philly. So um, I'm not a solar native. I actually was in and around city government a long time. And I think it's really helpful to kind of put where we are in Pennsylvania in particular in, um, in some context. Um, this is by the Natural Resources Defense Council, but if the Republican legislature commissioned a study happening with energy in Pennsylvania, it would look exactly the same. Uh, this is the percent of uh, energy generation by type. So um, from 1990 out into 2040, and it's a projection with policy case as is. No changes to the alternative energy portfolio standard, no REGI, uh, none of that stuff. This is like how it is today. And um, the black line is coal. As you can see, coal has you know, declined as a percentage of how we get our energy. Um, the orange line is nuclear. It's flatlined and it'll go down in this decade. There's a big debate about nuclear. Is it clean? Is it clean enough? Um, these are great local jobs and places that need them. So we can talk about that a little bit more if that's of interest. But the main thing to see is the red line, which is the growth of natural gas through the Marcellus shale. Um, and then renewables are ticking down there in the green line, um, pretty minimal all the way out. And um, there's a couple things to glean from this. The first is that, you know, in Pennsylvania, we export 30% of the energy we create. So we're a energy powerhouse. We're a lot more like Ohio um, than, you know, great solar states like Maryland, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, which just consume energy. And we actually put it out there. And uh, that's a historical thing. We've been an energy powerhouse for many decades. And there's a hope that solar and wind and other renewables like, you know, hydro can be a part of that. But the Marcellus has, has a very prominent force in the legislature. And also it's very, very inexpensive energy. And I think the thing to take from this chart outside of kind of our own particular advocacy is that if you talk to Republicans in Harrisburg, um, they would say that one of the benefits of Pennsylvania is that we have a, you know, we're for an all the above approach. We have a diversified energy portfolio and we get strength from that. And a point that we're trying to make to people is that if this is the case, that the, if these forecasts that you see in this chart are the case, um, we will not have a diversified energy mix um, at the end of this decade unless we change some of our state policy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Are you guys doing okay so far with this? Can you hear me all right? Good, solid, thank you. So uh, pivoting a little bit to um, kind of another area that Bunny and I talked about and that we wanted to spend a little time on. Um, we hear all the time that flat roofs are difficult for solar or people told that all the time. They are not, they're excellent for solar. We do tons of solar on flat roofs. This is a warehouse in South Philly. And um, this is actually an east-west design where the panels have this undulating sort of feature because of the racking. And there's a bunch of reasons we did east-west as opposed to south here. It's really about panel density and kind of the conf configuration. But um, know that flat roofs are excellent for solar and a lead to a very efficient solar installation. Um, we're doing a ton with drones, as are many of you, I suspect. Uh, we have two drone pilots and our license, and it's become a really critical tool for the industry. So in addition to just the obvious like 
eye candy and utility of being able to sheep offers like this. Um, we're doing a ton of uh, technology. This is a 3D dimensional model, sort of like GIS for buildings and forms if you do GIS work all through uh, drone flights. And then the image in the bottom right is a um, heat map of production. And this all gets animated so you can show shading over the course of a day and things and really next level stuff happening. Um, this is a really beloved and extremely long project. Uh, many of you may know this, the Ronald McDonald House. They've really stitched together an interesting campus at 39th and Chestnut. And we've been working on this project for four and a half years about, and it, which is astonishing how long it's taken. But it's wonderful, and they're wonderful people, and it will all be worth it. And we are going to do the install in the spring. And it's a pretty chopped up roof. The solar design has to kind of like find its way through some very cluttered rooftops. But I thought it was a good example because this is under construction. It's a little hard to see, but this is the new addition where we're also going to put some solar in these little black dots here where my mouse is. Um, these are all stanchions for uh, and attachments for the window washing. And the consequences for the solar design are that we have to keep these alleys, which really prevents kind of like a tightly packed solar array. We're going to have to do attachments rather than ballast mount in some places. And so some attention to kind of how you organize rooftop structures, window washing attachments, HVAC units, all that stuff can go a long way for facilitating like a solar ready design. It can still be done, but it's less good and it's more expensive. Um, where we met Ed was around the legislation we did to make solar canopies by right in Philadelphia. Um, a lot of the solar canopy projects were getting uh, trended towards variances because of height and setbacks. This is one that is finally done. It's in West Philly. Uh, real estate entrepreneurs are client here. And we used a pretty interesting product made by a company called Brooklyn Solar Works. And what's neat about them, it's a pre-engineered solar canopy. So you still need a stamp and it still needs to be configured to the space, but for different sort of lengths and widths and areas, they have kind of pre-assembled struts and assemblies. And, um, and as a result, uh, it's about three quarters done compared to starting with a straight up design. And there's a different aesthetic to it, but the benefits are really there in terms of cost. And we think they're pretty attractive. And our client um, has really done it up with kind of a vegetated surround and the lighting and all that stuff. We're expecting to see a lot of solar canopies because they are a nice amenity and they also let you go to the, a bigger solar array than a, just the roof might allow because the parapet walls do shading or whatever. So this is a really important tool for getting people to 100% offset. That said, as you know, like I was on a zoning uh, meeting earlier this week and we just got shouted off because of the anti-roof deck crowd. So um, there remain some challenges in getting this type of project, uh, you know, sort of done everywhere, but we can buy right under certain dimensional circumstances, which is really good, we think. Todd, what was the um, name of the a little. Sure, it's Brooklyn Solar Works. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Brooklyn. Yeah, Brooklyn Solar Works, and I'll put a link in there um, uh, before I before we distribute this, if that's okay. Uh, we became fast friends with them because they supported us during the long uh, the long um, walk to get the buy right legislation done. Uh, this is a project. Now where where is that in West Philly? Is that on Pentridge Street? It's on uh, 800 block of 49th Street. Okay, I. I live in West Philly. Okay. So it's the 800 block of 49th street. And, uh, our client's a pretty interesting fellow. He's a real estate entrepreneur and built a very untraditional house, which in, you know, created some zoning challenges for himself and, uh, which we faced also in doing the canopy up there. Um, but ultimately prevailed. Um, so this is, a uh, one, 171 West Berks, it's a mid-rise. And I thought this was an interesting example for you all. Um, this is Michael Scanapioco. I always botch their name, um, but they've been really wonderful to us. And it's sort of, we're getting a lot of new construction interest. It's really great. And I think what's cool about this project is that um, it's just a little lesson in how things can go. They're doing enough solar to manage their common spaces, which include elevator and some other stuff, but they also wanted a pergola on top for the outdoor space. 
So they were going to spend money on a covering of one kind or another. And we got to talking and developed kind of like this simple solar design. And then how things ended up shaking out is that the structure for the pergola is going to be built with the rest of the building rather than us doing it after. So they're saving some money there. And then meanwhile, they were going to spend the money anyway on a structure. And now it's kind of like going to be a living asset that helps them manage their electrical costs and will help their branding to have kind of like a full solar covered open space on the roof. And the uh, ability to kind of like dodge and weave with the design team, if we get in there early, has been really illustrative to us about how much more value we can add early on. Um, this is a neat project. It's just a kind of double row home where the guy had solar already and wanted some more. But I thought it was a, a good example of kind of many of the challenges of doing this type of electrical work and construction in Philly and kind of how we go about um, the process of the design. And so you got to get the power obviously from the roof down to the basement so that um, this is what's called behind the meter solar. So a lot of the benefits accrue through your uh, energy bill. Um, and so we have to tie into the energy systems and the metering and you got to get there somehow physically. So uh, that takes some art and some science. And this is an example where we really strung it together. And also this gentleman wanted more production than his initial solar array. So we had to do a lot of work to create, um, to work with a, you know, a product manufacturer to kind of get these solar panels appended to the house in creative ways, make sure it looks nice and it came out really great. And um, we're definitely the only folks who are uh, willing to undergo the pain to do this sort of project in Philadelphia. Um, which is not the most cost efficient, but is really striking. And I think is part of kind of like the living building challenge stuff that, that you all are very interested in. Certainly we are um, pivoting a little to some next gen stuff that's happening that I just thought would be of interest. Um, we've come to learn a little bit about this uh, still nascent, but really interesting area of solar called agrivoltaics. It turns out in a lot of climates, um, planting things under solar is better than um, planting them without solar or some type of shade structure. And the mix of light and shade, as well as kind of the environmental impact of being under solar panels can improve um, the agriculture. And so we're working a, a professor at Temple who is a international expert at this, you know, who knew um, got a really prestige grant to build Ambler, and we're just starting the design process. Um, but basically, we're doing a garden and then a same size, same shape garden under solar. And there's going to be all these sensors that look at uh, the soil characteristics, amount of moisture, humidity, temperature. It's like a you know eight year project, and we're going to kind of do a lot of different analysis. Um, and uh, we have an architecture intern actually who's taking it to the next level with some really nice renderings and really interesting stuff happening there. Um, another uh, very interesting trend that's not yet legal in Pennsylvania but assuredly will be is what's called community solar. So like before we started there was some discussion about the energy co-op and you know we're, there's going to be an explosion of ways to uh, get energy besides just your Pico bill. And community solar is a really neat uh, tool. And it's not yet legal in PA, but New Jersey's on its second pilot round. And like it's happening here because we now have the Farm Bureau and other really monetized land and rooftops that doesn't exist today. And what community solar is, is it's a larger solar array. So you get the, you know, the economies of scale and some of the benefits of doing a big solar array on a field or on a huge rooftop but then you sell the energy to individual subscribers. And it really reduces risk to a certain extent compared to the other ways that people monetize huge solar arrays because if one subscriber leaves, another subscriber can come and you're creating a whole new marketplace for you know, apartment tenants who can't really access local solar energy, people with really shaded rooftops. Like I live right, in, right near Fairmount Park and my roof's pretty shaded. It wouldn't be super cost efficient to put solar on and so, when community solar hits Pennsylvania, there's a lot of people who want to develop these. They're all waiting at the border for the right policy mix. 
Um, there's a lot of farmers who want to monetize their arid land, not their like prime agricultural land, but their arid land. It's an income generation for them. And then this will really develop a whole new kind of tier to the solar market. And utilities want it too. Uh, they also recognize it's a business, it's a threat to their business model as is, so fight. Um, many of you probably saw our colleagues, the Onion Flats guys, wrap fully wrap their building in solar panels, which is, um, you know, an aesthetic that not everyone loves, but kind of speaks to uh, where you can go if you really want to take kind of the pr local production to where it needs to be to kind of truly work on climate. Like we're nowhere near where we need to be yet. So uh, this is an interesting example. And my understanding is that they actually have had a lot of success leasing the building in an odd time for leasing. So it kind of speaks to their appetite for risk and kind of the follow through it's people respond to it well. And this is a TOD building, obviously it's right by the L and things. Um, there's, a, a, there's a ton to talk about with solar finance. And if we have time, I have like a assessment for how you look at that teed up but it kind of gets into the weeds. So it's only if we have time and there's a real interest. And I'm also happy to follow up with anyone about this offline. But I want to really quickly kind of the economic solar, it's really kind of the linchpin of the, of the deal. And it's important that we understand it so we can get people to be interested in solar. Um, I describe the economics of solar as kind of three major buckets. There's a bunch of tax benefits. Um, individuals can get the investment tax credit, which is a federal tax credit. So that's a one-to-one -one reduction in what you would pay the federal government. And that is um, currently 26%, but going down to 22%. And there's a lot of uncertainty how Biden and a divided Congress can maybe work on making that better. Um, if you're a business, you can also depreciate solar now in year one because of the you know, Trump tax cuts. So, and that, that legislation, um, and there's just some mixed thoughts on the tax benefits. You know, it gets very complicated. Um, if you buy a hundred thousand dollar solar array and you're a business, you write a check for a hundred grand, but the true cost is fifty thousand dollars between those two tax benefits. So we get your KWH rate down very, very low if you can utilize those tax benefits or monetize them, as the industry says. But this is all complex stuff and there's an argument to be made that the solar industry just needs to get over some of these tax subsidies tax ba tax based policies and subsidies and just compete compete um, so it's sort of a mixed bag and i'm not saying we want them to go away but they should at some point and it will make it easier and less complicated you also get all these kind of third party owners with nonprofit buildings and it just gets um uh, it's uh you want the subsidies but the tax code creates all this agita so um, I think there's kind of a mixed feeling about it ultimately as we grow. Um, the bulk of the value is in what's called the avoided cost. So instead of paying PICO or your utility, uh, you know, you've either purchased with cash or you're paying debt for a solar system and that's generating the energy. And you know, if you look at the tax benefits and you bring them down into the cost over the 25 year warranted performance of the panels, yada, 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 we can bring your kilowatt hour rate down to about half of what you pay a utility. Again, in Pennsylvania, we pay very low rates for energy. So, you know, that's one of the reasons that solar is much more prominent in California and Massachusetts. It's because we're competing against an avoided cost that's much, much lower here. And then the third bucket of value is uh, renewable energy credits, which is a state policy mechanism that sort of generates income over the life of the solar array. And in Pennsylvania, ours is relatively weak and flatlining this year or next year. Um, in New Jersey, it's extremely lucrative. And again, this is something we're working in Harrisburg on a lot. So um, I'll just conclude. These are kind of a quick list and we could add to these over time. I'd love your help with that, actually. These are some solar ready design considerations. It's pretty simple stuff. Like it's not rocket science, you know, make the most energy efficient building you can do so that you minimize consumption. Do that stuff before you buy solar so you can buy the smallest solar array possible. You know, we've done solar on passive house and, you know, it's just, that's where you want to be. Um, the, the main thing is to cluster rooftop mechanicals on the north side, not on the south side, and in as close a way as possible because if they're on the south side, they just to the roof. And if they're distributed everywhere, then you get that hatched up roof like we have at Ronald McDonald, um, which just is less good for solar. 
Uh, we're always going to need some sort of wire from, or at least in the near future, some sort of wire from the roof to the electrical room. So having that built in, having a vertical chaise or some space saves money and time. We'll often do work when the walls are open and then come back and do the solar after. Overwhelmingly, you're going to need an exterior disconnect at ground level for the firefighters. PICO is going to require this as is the city. So that can just be a little bit of a hustle if you have to do that way after the fact. Uh, they do make exemptions if your building is 24 seven access, um, but not everyone wants to allow PICO or the fire department to be able to come and trip the disconnect if there's a fire like in their living room. So it's a consideration. And then the other things are kind of like early thinking about the metering, who's gonna pay for what, how you organize the electric and who's gonna kind of pay for which types of consumption. Uh, for commercial over the next at least two years, you're always going to need two meters, but you only need one for residential. So we need two meter cans. It's just a space consideration. And that's tied to Pico's billing system, which is super annoying, but that's how it is. And then there's a lot to consider about entitlements, um, permitting with the building versus permitting after, how that interacts with um, kind of getting the Pico approval versus what's called the AHJ, the authority having jurisdictions approval. Um, so usually we do the interconnection first in case PICO has any challenges and then we kind of do the city stuff afterwards, but they can be done concurrently, really depends on the project, but it's just something to pause on. And then lastly, um, who's going to own the building over time has a lot to do with how you think about the solar investment. Is it a capital cost? Are you managing operating expenses? Uh, who's going to take the tax benefits, if anyone? How do you monetize them best and like kind of putting that into the finance mix so that you can have a you know really good outcome which we're always trying to do the way that we approach it is that you know solar is not like refinancing and it's going to pay for itself in one year in new jersey it'll pay for itself in three or four years there's a 25 year lifetime in pennsylvania that's a higher number so we have to work like with a lot of agility to create a value proposition for whoever is interested and uh that's what we're pretty dedicated to doing so those are kind of the remarks and slides I have. And like I said, I'm happy to kind of talk or discuss or Q&A. And then if people are interested, there's also a deep dive into how exactly we like assess a bill and do the math on why the solar would make a good financial value proposition. Thank you very much for having me again. Thank you, Todd. Could you speak a little bit in, in about the um, job opportunity and equity side of, of how Solar States operates within the city. Yeah, um, yes, thank you very much for kind of the nudge on that. So um, I'm not kind of the architect of the company, but like many of you, we're all trying to work for a, a brighter future one way or the other. And so the, the basic gist is Green New Deal and things like that. Solar installer is a very quickly growing job. It's the third quickest growing job in the country pre-corona. And um, it's a job that's a really good match for Philadelphia's workforce challenges. You don't need a high school degree. You don't actually even need a GED. You need modest training, OSHA 10, some basic electrical work, and um, you need to be able to move stuff around and um, work outside, and in some cases on roofs. And so, um, it's a really good match for Philadelphia's workforce challenges because we need, as many of you know, tens of thousands of reasonable jobs uh, for people that provide some level of family sustaining uh, salaries or wages. And so, uh, you know, we have these challenges with Harrisburg and how the solar financing works because of our particular state's policy approach. But if you step back, solar is one of the ways to get 10,000 new jobs in Philadelphia, 20,000 new jobs in Philadelphia. Um, Green New Deal or no Green New Deal. And so what we, how we set up solar states or how Mike, the guy who founded it and how we've all sort of espoused it is that um, we're doing education as well as solar. So we're very involved. I haven't mentioned like our great partnerships with the Philadelphia Energy Authority and places like OIC, uh, the Energy Conservation Agency. We have developed educational programming that's sort of vocational training uh, to get people who are interested in solar that first step of the way there. And then we hire out of those programs when contracts and growth allow. And like I said, we're like super appreciative and lucky we've been doing pretty good through the Corona, although we're nowhere near our sister states like New Jersey, which have 5% of their energy generation happening from solar. 
uh, compared to our half a percent. And as a result, we're getting folks who had no idea about the solar industry or that it existed onto roofs in their city, uh, you know, um, installing solar arrays. And that's very endearing to churches and nonprofits and city governments and other organizations. And it's also of real interest to the trades who see how the growth in solar can really benefit their members. Trades, it's a little uh, challenging because like for many types of construction, for commercial projects, it's very tight to pay um, sort of full prevailing wages. And then on residential, it's not even a question. You can't do that. The projects are too small. The margins are too skinny. Um, so we're trying to develop the right type of relationships with the very important trades. And then we think they're going to be really helpful um, in advocating for better solar policy in Harrisburg too. Um, the Energy Authority is an organization that sits in city council. So it was put there because it can do things procurement wise a little differently than if it was under the mayor. Um, but they, as part of kind of council president Clark and some others have set about a energy agenda, energy efficiency, CPACE financing, growth of solar, all that stuff to create 10,000 jobs in Philadelphia through focusing on that sector. So we're a part of that effort and we're all trying to row together. And so many of the programs you see like Solarized Philly, lending, these are all effort, especially under a Biden administration. Um, but it's not without its challenges as we saw, you know, over the last several weeks. Did I lose you or does that make no. sense? No, okay. thank you. Great, so if you have folks who are interested in solar, send them over. We try to get folks into these various tracks. There's like young, there's a club course we're doing with high school students. ECA is kind of younger and middle-aged adults and people can enroll in these programs. Some of them are free, some of them are nominal cost and we will try to get you uh, trained up and then we're part of trying to get people hired. And we do outreach to other solar companies too, although there's really only one other solar company that works in Philly. It's pretty small, but you know, there's a lot of interest in solar. And like I said, it's a very quickly growing. Field. So um, we will make efforts to like help people who want to get into this industry. But we all also have to advocate for its growth concurrently, which is what we're trying to do. Yeah, that's great. If you could provide, you know, links to, to those things when you send us through the, uh, the presentation that you gave today, that would be helpful. And we can, you know, get, get that out through our media channels as well to help broaden awareness. Sure. Any questions from our COAP members? All right, well, um, Todd, you're welcome to stay on. We've, we've got, you know, a full remaining agenda to, to run through. Um, but thank you so much. This was inspirational, great information, information rich, um, much, much appreciated. All right, thank you very much. I'll linger for a minute. I don't wanna um, outstay my welcome and then I'll yeah. just pop off at some point. Thanks very much. Okay. Oh, hey, terrific, hey, David, terrific. can you hear yes. me? Yes, Brian, I can hear you. Oh yeah, so uh, real quick question for, uh, for Todd. Are you going to be testifying at the Reggie hearings, uh, the state Reggie hearings next month? Um, I, I, I didn't pause on Reggie or a lot of the state stuff because I wanted to try to be have some brevity. Um, we have a, so we're supporting Reggie and we support the governor and our various sort of business. We have a solar business group. Um, let me say this. The solar industry is unfortunately has a schism in its advocacy, which is not unique to Pennsylvania, but and is not unique to environmentalists to eat our own young. But um, we unfortunately don't all speak exactly the same. And I used to work for an elected official just locally, but it's really. Uh,
I believe when like a group has multiple speaking, not the same, uh, because it makes it really hard to help the elected official help them. And um, we are approaching Reggie, unfortunately, like that, like Reggie uh, should be great and is a good environmental policy, I personally believe, but it's unclear how it will help the solar industry. Um, it has taken the oxygen out of the room for the things that the solar industry does really want and other industries really want. And um, it's also not clear that it's gonna work, like it's engendered so much opposition. Whereas we think something like solar can slide in in Harrisburg with a lot of different types of support because a lot of people like solar, it's local jobs, it's independent energy. I mean, you pick the name. So Reggie doesn't have that characteristic. It's actually become like, you know, something that the governor is gonna sort of like die on the pole for. And like Reggie would be great, but like, it's not clear that it's gonna help solar as much as other things could and also, it's certainly not going to be possible to do what would be great to do. So, um, with, so we're all supporting Reggie personally, and we um, are writing letters and doing the things that one does. But it's actually kind of like a little bit of a speed bump for what the solar industry would like to have happen. And when you have distractions, um, that makes it harder to get hard to get things done even harder. Sorry, I didn't say that right, but like, so it's making it harder, even though it's not bad. Um, and I don't think we're going to personally testify, although individual solar companies are writing letters, which we did, and our trade association is, you know, sort of as a big picture supporting Reggie and want to support the governor because the governor has supported solar. But again, I want to make this modest point that like Reggie's sort of slowing what we really want uh, for a variety of reasons. And that's not great. Great, thanks. If, there, if there's time for one qu more question, and David, you could cut me off if there isn't, but um, can you comment a little bit about batteries? Oh, yeah, shoot, shoot, Jonathan. That's right. Um, you know, battery backup systems for resilience, is that a thing? Is that sort of a, is that sort of like more of a, an old school, you know, sort of off the grid type of thing? Uh, well, so that's its origins. Um, I'm really glad you asked. I didn't put it in the presentation because again, I was trying to be fast. Out of Corona, we are getting a ton of people who want battery backup for resiliency, as you might imagine. Um, they're, uh, they are almost where they need to be for pricing. Uh, and this is the future. And I, and I didn't mention this in kind of what's coming, but um, a, an important consideration for you all is that PICO has petitioned the PUC. Someone asked me the other day, is energy a regulated industry? And it's not like how you think about the stock market or something, but actually we have many, many overlords and they all have different footprints and considerations. And the interaction of a utility and the public utility commission is such. So it's demand-based pricing. So we expect over the next two years, let's call it, the way that Pico bills to change, and it will be very favorable for solar, and it will be favorable for the energy markets. And right now, businesses pay two types of charges. Resi pays only one. If time of use happens, there will be a different rate from our understanding is from 2 to 6 p.m., which is when the majority of energy consumption happens. That puts pressure on the grid. The grid operators have to call more power in from the various assets that are available, which includes solar on people's homes and businesses, utility scale solar, but also gas fired power plants, the whole lineup. And if you go to time of use, batteries will become a much more favorable value proposition financially because you can arbitrage pricing, you can store energy and then deploy it from your battery and not go from the grid. And, and all that stuff's going to be able to happen from your smartphone and you can run your dishwasher from far away when the price is low. And, you know, that whole kind of like vision of the futures were close. Um, right now, people bulk at battery pricing the way they bulk still at solar pricing unless they have an EV or they're sort of like, you know, really into it, or we can put a value proposition in front of them that says like, you know, you're just going to pay for itself in six years or kind of like, here's the value benefit. You know, it's really custom, unfortunately, for the way I approach it and a lot of my colleagues approach it, but we're super close. Um, and 
time of use will put that over the top. That said, there's a bunch of people whose power goes out six, eight times a year and they could care less. They want a battery system and they're gonna get a Tesla power wall in 2021. It's gonna make them very happy. Um, but the considerations that go into batteries are still pretty complicated because when people understand how much it costs to power your whole home, they get sort of agitated. And so what the conversation is really about is having some discipline about what it is that you really want to be able to do two days into an outage. Thank you, Todd. And we, we definitely need to have you back again. You know, electrification of our city and neighborhoods is, is a conversation that we need to continually unpack. Thanks for everything. You guys are also doing important things for the region and um, moving towards the future in special ways. And uh, thanks again for having me. Thank you, Todd. All right. Let me bring... Share my screen again.